lot uh, on the plate today. You're going to get tired of me. All right, take your Bibles with me. My text is Ephesians, but before we get there, turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark 10. So if you got your Bibles, Gospel of Mark, Matthew, Mark, and chapter 10. I'm trying to tie all this together with the, the baby dedication and with Mother's Day and, and all these themes going through my head. So Mark chapter 10, and as I read this first reading, we've got a bunch of children here today. I can see Zoe, good to have Zoe, and Jemima's here, all these, all these wonderful kids. So I want you to be asking yourself, especially kids, what does Jesus think of you? What does Jesus think of you? Especially if you're a child today, if you're a young person, a teenager even, what does Jesus think of you? So Mark chapter 10, and look at verse 13. Verse 13, and they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we do ask, Lord, that you would give us not only teaching, instruction this morning, not just feeding us academically, but we ask that you would change us and strengthen us so that we can obey what we hear from your word this morning and most of all, lead us closer to Jesus, to trust in him. In his name we pray, amen. All right, now Ephesians, got your Bible still, Ephesians chapter six, and here's my text for today. Galatians, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter six, last chapter of the book. And as I read this, you know, this is important too. I think it's really important every time we read God's word, every time we think about God's word, every time it's preached or, or whatever, that we keep in mind that God always has something to say to us. No matter who we are, God is speaking to us always. Um, at the same time, God does have some very specific things to say to young people here and to children but I'm going to be saying today, this is for the whole church. So even if you don't have children, or even if you're very young, or whatever the case is, God is still speaking to you this morning from this text. So a message for children, a message for parents, but really a message for all of us as well. So Ephesians chapter 6, and just the first four verses. Verse 1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. All right. So looking at our text, children, young people, um, what are you to do? Should I make it a public question? If you're in primary school, what are you to do? What's the command there from Ephesians 6? What are you to do? I know, big group. A lot of people. Oh! Obey your father and mother, right? And the next verse is honor, right? Honor your father and mother. Children, obey your parents and honor them. Not hard to pick out the command there. Not hard to understand that, but sometimes it can be hard to do, right? I'm looking at you kids, sometimes it's hard to do, but it's not hard to understand. God wants us to listen to and to answer and to uh, do what our parents tell us to do. And that's what verse 1 says. And verse 2, honor your father and mother. In other words, value them, revere them, um, listen to them, give honor to your father and mother. That's the instruction. And future parents, we may have some future parents here, um, you need to pay attention here because Paul is, is teaching you about the kind of parents you ought to be and about the kind of kids that you want to raise. And to the wider church, the wider church, even if you don't have children, every Christian has a responsibility to help parents and children in our church family to be the kind of church where godly children are raised in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I'm not saying spank kids that aren't your own. 
but I'm saying encourage parents and do what you can to, to bless them. And before I get too far along, we got some new parents in the back row there. Can I just point out Jordan and Sarah are with us this morning with Alexis, first time here. So good to have you guys. Sarah grew up here at ECG, and now she's a mother. Really cool. So you never know what God's going to lead you to do in your life. Um, maybe you're a future parent. Maybe you're a church member. But we have this command. Children, obey your parents. That's the duty of every child. And there's also, let me get this right, there's an inferred instruction to parents, even in verse 1. Parents, one of your main duties is to teach your children to obey. Because it makes no sense that God would require obedience of children and not expect parents to require obedience from their kids. That's part of our job, right? So I just want to make that point really, really clearly. Moms and dads, teach your children to obey. And that word teach is important because it doesn't come naturally. No kid is born with this desire to always do what their parents tell them to do, right? So use your authority in godly and kind ways. I'll talk about that later. Use your authority to require your children to obey. And I don't mean, you know, to have to bribe them or to have to always get down on their level and sweet talk them and to beg them. I'm saying teach them to respect your authority that God's given you as a parent. And I know it's hard in this day and age. Um, to do that consistently and to expect it the first time. We always, whether it happened or not, we always expect it the first time with our kids. Because if you have to say it five times, you're teaching them, well, four times you're allowed to disobey, the fifth time, okay, you have to obey. Or yet, if you have to beg them to obey, you're not teaching them about your authority. So I don't mean beg them or bribe them or whatever, but teach them. God's given you that position. Verse 1, again. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That phrase, in the Lord, is important. And he's saying to kids, children, you're to obey your parents because you're in the Lord. Because you're Christians, because you love Jesus. It flows from your relationship with Jesus. He's your master. He's your boss. Right? He's your Lord. And if this is what he wants, well then, you do it because it's right and it's in the Lord. That phrase in the Lord provides some limits as well in the Lord because on rare occasions, maybe a mom or a dad will tell their kids to do something that goes against God's will, something sinful, something wicked. Uh, so obviously that's not to be done. God's will comes first. It's in the Lord. So parents, why do we want our kids to listen to us? I'm sure you get all kinds of reasons. But notice what Paul says here. In fact, he has two reasons but let me back up on Ephesians and just zoom out and have you see the wider context of Ephesians. If you don't know this, we did this in Bible study quite a few years ago. Ephesians, the first three chapters, it's great theology. It's, it's all about our great salvation in Christ, what Jesus has done for us. First three chapters, how he loves us and how he's given himself for us. It's, it's this great theology. But then in chapter 4, verse 1, he begins to apply that theology. What he's saying in verse 1 is, Therefore, I, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. He uses that word, therefore. He's saying, therefore, because of all these blessings you have in Christ, because he saved you, because he's brought you from death to life, therefore live it out. Because you're saved, because you're believers, obey the Lord. That's the big motivation. We have been loved by God in Christ, and it fuels and it motivates us to obey him from the heart. So if we don't understand this in our Christian parenting, if we don't understand that it flows from our relationship with him, a changed heart, if it's just outward obedience that we're looking for, you're going to raise a little Pharisee who obeys mom and dad while mom and dad are looking, um, but not from the heart. Uh, you're going to raise a child who, um, you know, on the outside looks great, but the attitude on the inside is not right. It's like the story about the mom who kept on asking little Johnny to go and sit down, and Johnny wouldn't do it. He wouldn't sit down. He wouldn't do it. Finally, he sat down with a big scowl, and he said to his mom, I may be sitting down on the outside, but on the inside I'm standing up. That's not real heart-transformed attitude obedience. That's not what we're aiming at. 
we're aiming at because you love the Lord, because you're in the Lord, uh, this is how you should obey. It's rather like the attitude of the teens who say, well, I'm a Christian sort of because my parents are, but I'd really much rather be somewhere else on a Sunday morning or on a Friday night or whatever. It describes many adult Christians, maybe even here today, who say, well, yes, I go to church because I was raised that way, but my real passion is surfing or golf or whatever else they'd like to do on a Sunday. Your goal as parents is not outward obedience. I want to make that real clear. Your goal is not outward obedience. That's not the fruit of successful parenting. We want our children to be in the Lord and to know the love of God for them so that they respond in loving obedience to Him. We want them to be transformed and to say, how could I not want to follow Jesus because I love Him and He loves me? So we can put it another way. Kids, the way that you listen to your mom and dad, your grandma and grandpa, whoever else is, is leading you, should show to all your friends, whatever the situation you're in, how much you love Jesus. The way you respond to your parents shows how much you love Jesus. So take a look at our text. Obey your parents in the Lord. And then he gives us a couple of extra motivations. He says, first, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It's kind of like your mom and dad saying to you, do that. Why? Because I told you so. Well, I don't think that's exactly what he's saying. He's saying this is the right thing to do because this is God's design. This is the way that God has created you and created your parents and put them in this position. Your parents, kids, are not there to spoil your fun. Your parents are not there to make you miserable. They've been given to you by God to help you understand how to live in this world that he's put you in. So obey your parents because it's right. It's the right thing to do that God's designed the world this way. And the second motivation there is from the Ten Commandments. And Paul goes back to the fifth commandment where you have honor your father and mother. And then you have this promise. And Paul says that's the first commandment with a promise. And the promise is that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. That's not like the mom that said to her kid, you know, you must obey me. I brought you into this world. I'll take you out. That's not the idea here. <laughs> the idea is, you know, back when God gave that command in the Ten Commandments, uh, that they were inheriting the land, right? They were inheriting the promise, and living long in the land was what the promise was. And Paul picks up on that, and he says, not that if you obey your parents, you get to live a long time in the Middle East, but that if you obey God here, you obey your parents, His way, things tend to go better for us. I'm speaking generally. Things tend to go better for us when we obey our mom and dad. And all the parents are like, yeah, that's right, I've been talking about that. Things tend to go better. When we obey our parents, generally speaking, life goes better for us. And if we're rebellious, and we're always kicking against the goad, as Paul says, uh, things don't tend to go very well for us. And you can think of all kinds of examples in your own life of that. It's the wisdom of Proverbs. Proverbs 10, uh, 27, the fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be short. And you know that to be true. It's not rocket science. It's not saying, though, that you won't suffer or that you won't have hard times or that you won't be miserable at times. Or even that you want to lose your life for Christ's sake. That may happen. But God's word is here saying, generally speaking, uh, when we walk in God's ways, things work best. So point number one, children obey your parents. And the kids are like, ah, come to church on Mother's Day and preachers talk about obeying my parents. Listen to your mom and dad because it's right. Uh, and, and that's a good enough reason, right? The way God's designed things but also listen to your parents because that's a foundational way that you show that you've understood how much you've been loved by God. Amen? Amen. Secondly, moms and dads, especially dads, verse 4, you say, well, this is Mother's Day. I think one of the best gifts to moms is to have dads that do this in verse 4, right? Yeah. So raise your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Notice two things here. Verse 1. Paul is assuming that children would be sitting there hearing his letter, his scroll, whatever it was, read in their gathering. 
hearing these things ex explained to them. And it's something I've always felt personally important in our church. I love that we have kids in our service. I love that we don't shoo them away from the whole service and then they come back later on and, oh yeah, you were, oh, you were here. I love that we have noise. Sometimes parents are kind of embarrassed. Oh, my kid was crying or singing today. Oh, he was singing. It was great. I love that. And even if the pastor is distracted at times, which happens, that's okay because we're a family and you, hopefully you forgive the pastor when he gets distracted and so on. But we're a family and we need to let our kids see the worth of hearing God's word expounded together, right? We're in this together, we're family. So our children need to know that they're part of the gathering of God's people. And even if it's hard, you know, even if it's kind of distracting and you have to stand in the back and kind of rock them or sometimes send them off to crash, that's fine. We're together, we're in this together, amen? I think that's important at ECG. I don't want to be a church that just pushes them away all the time. But then here's the kicker. Looking at our text, verse 4, the expectation is also that dads would be there and would be committed to the spiritual leadership of their family. I'm talking to Christian dads here, that they're with the church. And so Paul addresses fathers directly, verse 4. Why, after talking to mothers and fathers directly, does he now talk to fathers? Does, does, he, does it mean that mums are off the hook? That mums don't have to worry about exasperating their children or making their kids angry? I think Paul's making a really important, important point here about the place that fathers have in a Christian family. Um, fathers have a place of responsibility. The fathers must lead their kids in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Mums are indispensable. Mums do stuff that, that dads can't do and shouldn't have to do and shouldn't do, right? And fathers have great responsibility to set the agenda of their home. Dads, you ought to give careful attention to the important role you have to raise your kids in a godly way because God holds you accountable for these things or he wouldn't command it, right? Verse 4. This is tough. I came across a study this week. It's in that book that I gave those moms and dads earlier. Um, and it goes back to a study 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, in Touchtone magazine. And the study in Switzerland examined the connection between a parent's church attendance and the future likelihood that his or her children would attend church. Now listen, this is, this is really interesting. The study found that the father's spiritual example was the primary tool that shaped his children's desire to embrace his Christian faith. And that didn't surprise me as much as how strong that correlation was between fathers and their kids. And I about fell out of bed. I was reading this to Hannah, and I thought, whoa, let me read that again. I'll quote, in this study, when both father and mother attended church regularly, Christian parents, 33% of their children ended up as regular churchgoers, so one out of three. But when the father was non-practicing and the mother a regular attender, church attender, only 2%, 2% of their children become regular worshipers. Now, I know that's, you know, there are always exceptions and, and all these types of things. That's just one example, church attendance. But the point of that chapter in that book was to say, dads, you are indispensable. You are so important. In, in this day and age when, when fathers and, you know, oh, patriarchy, that's bad, and all these kind of things you hear on the radio, this is so important. Dads, you are so needed. So here's a great Mother's Day gift to the mother of your kids. Be good fathers. Be committed fathers to your kids. What this passage does, verse 4, is it contributes to the whole teaching that, that dads are important, and you're important because you're mimicking, you're, you're, you're following the, the model of your heavenly father. Um, God teaches children to respond to the fatherhood of God through their earthly fathers. Sometimes in a negative way, right? We often hear about bad dads, and maybe that was your experience. But even there, God's in a negative way teaching how perfect and wonderful he is. How blessed we are with our Heavenly Father. But kids learn about their Heavenly Father first and foremost through their fathers. And that's sobering because it means how we treat our children is teaching them what God is like far often, far more often than you know, sitting down and reading the Bible story, which is important. You need to read Bible stories and all these things. That's important. But your example 
is the most important thing, right? So there's not a person here who has not been radically shaped by their dads, whether they were present or absent, um, whether they were harsh or kind, whether they were overbearing or quite weak, we've all been shaped by our fathers. And notice, we're especially shaped by their attitude towards us. And that's why before they're commanded to raise their kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, they're told, don't provoke them to anger. And I always I thought about that. What's the connection here? Why are fathers not to provoke their kids to anger? And I think the reason is because it's not displaying our heavenly father's attitude towards us. I think that's the connection. God, you know, you think about all these reasons why we might provoke our kids to anger. One reason might be when we ignore our kids, right? When, when, when they're not important to us, I was talking to somebody earlier about this, when we ignore them, that provokes our children to anger. And, and rightly so. They're a part of our lives. They need to be central to what we do. Um, when we don't have compassion on our kids, when, you know, God is always compassionate. He's gracious to us. His guidance is always filled with grace and forgiveness. That's the way that dads should relate in attitude to their children. Uh, think about the harsh times you've been through in your life, when you've suffered, when you've had a hard time. And you say, God, why are you doing this to me? Why are you allowing this into my... It's always for our good. The Bible says that, right? For our good, for his glory, Romans 8, 28. It's so that your joy may be complete. If God was allowing suffering in your life and it wasn't for your good, we'd have a right to be angry, I suppose. So if in your parenting, you know, you're causing difficulty and suffering to your kids and it's not for their good, well, that goes so far beyond what God's done for us. If God was just random, arbitrary, chaotic, we'd be angry. Don't be like that with your children. God's not like that. Are you, are you following me? Are you tracking with me today? Okay. That's what God the Father is like. And so then that's why verse 4 do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the nurture or the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So don't be indifferent. God's never indifferent to his kids. You know, I think it's really important always to take notice of them. Um, remember Jesus says, don't be anxious in the Sermon on the Mount. Don't be anxious, for your heavenly Father knows what you need. That's how you should be with your parenting. Favoritism, God doesn't keep favorites, shows no partiality. God's commands are never arbitrary. Uh, he never gives commands without helping his kids to fulfill them, his children to fulfill them. That's the way we need to be, be like him. And the point is that our parenting must be modeled after the way our Heavenly Father deals with us. Fathers, here today, do you show your children their Heavenly Father by the way that you parent by your attitude, because God teaches children to respond to their Heavenly Father through the, the work of the Father right in front of them. Huge impact. So particularly important when it comes to discipline and training, verse 4. What's the goal of disciplining our children, of training our children? What are we aiming at? As I said, it's not outward obedience. It's inward heart change. It's attitude change. We want to shape their hearts with the gospel, don't we? Our, our goal is to prepare them one day to stand before God. We want them to be born again. Uh, and that's a lot deeper than just outward behavior. And so when we discipline them, when we correct them, when we actively train them and engage with them, we're to have a much deeper goal in mind. We want their attitude to be Godward. Because that's how God deals with us, right? The goal of discipline is always to win their hearts to the Lord. And so we're called to discipline. We're, we're called to appropriately train them, punish them if need be, help our children to see the seriousness of their sin. And then when that happens, we're going to have to explain to them the gospel. We're going to want to. Um, because the gospel doesn't end with teaching that God is holy. It doesn't end there. It goes on to say that's why we need a Savior. God is holy. He doesn't take our sin lightly. When you hit your sister, that's bad. That's wrong. God is holy. He doesn't like that. But that's why you need a Savior, just like Daddy needs a Savior, Mommy needs a Savior, and so on. So 
You're going to have to talk to them about the gospel. You're going to have to set an example before them. That's why marriage is important. Because marriage is this great example of the gospel being worked out in your life. I always struggle. Hannah can tell you wherever she's sitting. I always struggle saying, I'm sorry. That's me. You know, I, I just I, I struggle with that. But our kids need to see that. Hey, dad did wrong. He, he said something out of turn. His attitude is wrong. And so we need to be able to say, honey, I'm sorry I messed up. Or, or, or child, I'm sorry I messed up here. You know that I need a savior here. What's time we got? We need to practice offensive parenting, not defensive parenting. This comes out of that book again that I gave those couples. What he means by that is not to be an offense to somebody, but to be on the offense. Right? Too many parents, especially Christian parents here, fall into defensive parenting, where they spend all their time with this defensive mindset, worried about the evil influence of this or that and keeping them off the team because of that kid or that kid. And yes, parenting does involve protecting your child. That's very important. But that should not be your main focus. You follow? You need to be on the offense telling them about the, the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to be actively going after your child's heart, making Jesus attractive to them. Now, I'm really afraid that we grow up and they, they, they hear about Jesus and it's not very attractive to them because he's not attractive to us. We need to change that in our lives. So, so help them see their sin, yes, and then help them see the grace and forgiveness that's theirs in Christ. Don't just say, hey, you hit your sister. Say sorry, you know, and that's important. But then go before the Lord and say, you need to confess this to him and then realize he forgives you because he loves you. And he sent Jesus for you. So, so teach them to say sorry to God. Pray for them. Pray with them. Um, the center in your home needs to be how they relate to Jesus. That's how you need to be training and instructing them. Verse 4. All right. So we've already read today about Deuteronomy chapter 6. Rising up and sitting down. And everywhere you go, you're always talking about the gospel and talking about God's word. We did that here and I. Every time we got in the car... Everything, everyone that we knew was an example to us of working out the gospel and, and applying it. Saturate your life with the gospel, not simply so that they know stories. I mean, it's important to know the Bible story. It's important to memorize scripture, yes. But do it so that their heart is right with the Lord. Aim at the heart. So again, I'm sure that seems like rambling, but number one, Children obey your parents in the Lord. Number two, parents, you've got to instruct them about the Lord in the gospel. But there's no power in the law, right? There's no power in working defense all the time, but there's great power in the Lord Jesus Christ and His Spirit working in your child's heart. You follow? You follow? Now, Perhaps you come in today and thought, oh, that was his Mother's Day, Mother's Day, he's talking about all this, and, and I'm a kid, and he's telling me to obey my parents, and, and in so many ways, you know, children, we failed. I can guarantee this week, children, that you failed, not necessarily on the outside, because you're Christian kids, but on the inside, your attitude towards mom and dad. Yes, I'll sit down, but I'm standing up on the inside, that kind of thing. So maybe you're a young person, and you realize how you've been so disobedient, well, for those children and for those adults as well, we need to remember God's grace. This is central. Remember God's grace. It's important to remember that there once was a child who was always obedient to his heavenly father. It was not you. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. And even in his obedience, he went to the cross. He obeyed his father and went to the cross for us. And his death wipes away the sins of every disobedient child. Amen? Everyone. Come to him in, in, in full grace. He will forgive us. And wonderfully, not only are our sins forgiven, but he gives us his righteousness. Puts that on our account as well. So remember God's grace. Kids, if you've messed up this week and your parents can help you on this, remember God's grace. And then parents... And I'm sure you're sitting here saying, oh, let me come to church for this. He's talking about all this. And I've fallen short. And I tell you, Hannah and I, we fall short all the time. Sure you have. But your heavenly Father is more gracious than you are. 
And I'll say it again, your heavenly Father is more gracious than you are, and he delights to forgive more than you do. Amen? So pray to him, come to him, ask him for strength and mercy, and there is grace and power and hope always in the Lord, always. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Parents, bring your children up in the, in the instruction and discipline of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for our moms that are here today, and uh, we just praise you for the work they do, and I'm mindful that so often in the church it's the moms who are the really, really committed ones and who are here and who are serving you, and um, Father, we just pray for your strength to be upon them. We pray for our dads as well, uh, that you would just really strengthen them to be good, godly leaders in their families, that they would lead by their examples, by their words, by their prayers, all these things, Lord. Bless our fathers too. And Lord, in our church, may the men here, may they just step up, I do pray, um, to, to look out for the young ones that, that need godly examples and need strength and, and uh, maybe the older moms who can help the younger moms, all these things, Lord, because we are a family. And we're not judgmental, we're not judging each other. We're calling out for your help, Lord, on this. We're calling out for your grace. And we thank you, Lord, that if we come to you for forgiveness, because we've all messed up, uh, Lord, you promised you are faithful and just, and you will forgive us of all of our sins. Well, Father, there may be people here today, too, that, um, that don't know you as their heavenly Father. And I, I just pray, Lord, that they would come to Jesus this morning. They would trust in him and realize they can be adopted into the, the perfect family, the perfect family, and have you as their heavenly Father. And uh, we just pray, Lord, for those people, too, who are searching for you. May they come to you, repent, and believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Sam.